Well, a very good morning to everybody this morning here, both online and in person. We uh, welcome you this morning, and we thank you for being here with us today. Uh, we've got a great day of worship coming forward, and really got juiced on the the uh, music that we had this morning as we were practicing the music, and we got a lot of good things coming up. This next Saturday is going to be a real special day, and uh, Shannon and Bruce are getting married on Saturday, so we're getting all the uh, final things ready to go for that, and uh, that should be an awesome, awesome time. August 1st is going to be the final uh, service over at Huss, and so we're going to have a number of our members over there. They're going to be present there that day uh, to participate in that, and uh, we wish all of those at Huss all the very best. August 14th is our next Orange Track Racing, and so we're going to convert this place back into a, a raceway in here and have some real good times with that and have, have a really good time as, uh, uh, oh yeah, I've got to sneak in the dad humor there, yeah, <laughs> anybody that hangs around Wade knows a really good time. Uh, so we have that coming up, and then uh, we decided on our movie for September, which is going to be What If? And that's all I'm going to say about it. How about that? So let's begin our time uh, with a word of prayer here, shall we? Lord, as we enter into this time of worship, we praise you and thank you for being here amongst us this morning. Lord, your word tells us that where there are two or more gathered in your main, there I am amongst you, and we just praise you and thank you for that. We thank you for this opportunity to come together today to worship freely and openly, to explore your word and your truth, and to bring a different uh, look at a perspective on what it means to be courageous as Pastor Terry brings forth the message that you've laid upon his heart. We ask a special blessing on him as he delivers that message today. We ask a blessing on Pastor Bruce as he prepared the music and picked out uh, what needs to go along with this message again today. And so, Lord, we just open this time up, giving you all the honor, all the glory, and all the worship today. In your precious and holy name, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Oh, just as, as always, when we prepare uh, for worship, we just welcome in the Holy Spirit as well amongst us here so that so we might feel your presence here at Ray Street Church and here in Cedar Rapids, Iowa in a world that needs God a world that needs God in our homes, our communities our state, our nation, and our world
Thank you very much, Pastor Bruce. Those are just awesome songs. They really speak to me. In that quiet hour, in that last song, when we think about that, in the quiet hour is when God really speaks to us. You know, when we shut off all the noise and we shut off all the world and we shut off all our worries and we submit all of our cares to God, He speaks to us in that silent hour. So I want to think about that as we come into this time of worship today, is just submitting ourselves to God fully in worship. Let him speak to us today. Let him speak to our hearts and have it bless us to our very soul. Our call to worship today comes from 2 Timothy 1, 7 that Pastor Terry has picked out for us today and it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. And so I have a question to ask you today as we think about this passage. And I kind of mentioned it in my sermon last week, but uh, when we come to think about this, have you ever had people come against you because they didn't agree with something you said or something that you do? And if you do, you know, you, you felt that pressure that came on. Did it make you, you know, want to change what you were doing just in order to please them? And, you know, change what you're doing. Even if it's the right thing, they want to pressure you into doing it their way instead. And as I was listening to the news yesterday, I, 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 was, I was just going, wow, you know. They want to censor out people who have a different opinion and take it off social media and mandate it from a government level. And I said, you know, that's just, that's just not right. If they don't agree with you there, they still get to have a voice. They still get to have a form. So when we think about this, and we, we read this section in 2 Timothy in here, this is the exact same thing that Timothy was facing at that point in time. Timothy was experiencing great opposition to his message and to himself as a leader because of the fact that he was young. And because of his age, people just weren't taking him seriously. And because of this and his pressure and everything, they were kind of taking him just at face value. He's, hey, he's just a young guy, so he doesn't speak for what he should. He shouldn't be speaking for God because he's just too young. You see, God doesn't put an age limit on anybody. And so Timothy was facing all of this pressure. His youth, his association with Paul, and his leadership had come under fire from believers and unbelievers alike. And that pressure was causing him to rethink his purpose. And here Paul is urging him to be bold, to speak out, to be courageous. And if and when we allow people to intimidate us, then we neutralize that effectiveness that we have for God. We neutralize it. We can't dumb down what God wants us to do, what he puts on us on our hearts. What he calls us to do, we can't dumb that down to try and please other people. We have to act boldly in the face of that resistance. And that power to do that comes from the Holy Spirit. And see, that power of the Holy Spirit can overcome that. It can overcome our fear of what others might say or do so that we can continue to do God's work. And we as believers, we have three characteristics that that Paul mentions in this verse of Timothy in here. And one is the characteristic of an effective Christian leader, and that is power, love, and self-discipline. And see, these are available to us as believers because the Holy Spirit lives within us. He emboldens us. He empowers us. He equips us to be able to do those work, those God-given works that he lays upon our hearts. And following that spirit each day will bring us closer to God so that we will more fully exhibit these characteristics of God and to an unbelieving world. And so God uses us to mirror himself to an unbelieving world. And he does that through the power of the Holy Spirit. And ultimately that leads us into the fruits of the spirit as we find in Galatians. Because the Holy Spirit living within us will change our characteristics that the world sees. And it might change the world in the process. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord, as we come before you right now, we wait 
in earnest to hear your message this morning. Lord, put it upon our hearts. Open our ears to hear, our eyes to see the glories of your world. Open our hearts to receive your message and to take your spirit upon us today. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us and guide us today as we hear your word. Amen. Amen. <laughs> This was a challenging sermon title. Not very PC to call somebody a wimp. <laughs> I remember as a kid, hey, wimp. I didn't like that name. I got picked on. It, it just has a connotation, and that it's just not politically correct. But in a world where political correctness has overtaken us, we have to call it for what it is. Are we going to be warriors or are we going to be wimps? And we're going to talk about that more today and what that truly means. But let's recap. Last week, Pastor Mark started off our series on the move, from the movie Courageous. Uh, and the, the overarching title of the series is Living a Courageous Life. And he talked to us about being courageous versus being complacent. And he challenged us. He said, he challenged us to be courageous. He challenged us to be bold. He challenged us to stand up for Jesus. He challenged us to stand against popular culture and political correctness. And it was that reason that I didn't change this title. I didn't look for any synonyms or anything for whims. I just went with it. We rolled. And he challenged us to stand strong for our families and their future. He challenged us to stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. Because there's a lot of them out there. And that starts with children who have just been conceived and goes all the way to our end of our earthly life. There are people beginning and end and all the way in between that cannot stand up for themselves. And then he asked the question, if not you, then who? This movie is about men of courage, standing up for their families. And, and it, it came out, where, where are these men? Where are these men of God? And, and I, I, I just can hear uh, the movie at the end when, when he's standing at the pulpit and they, after they've signed their, their resolutions. And he looks out at this group of people that are sitting out there, men, women, and children, and he says, where are you? Men of courage. Where are you, men of courage? What on earth could be more important? What could garnish more attention and warrant more, more time than leading, protecting, and investing in our families? Here's the thing. And this statistic, this is, this is an older statistic, and we're going to get up to a newer one here in just a moment. But at one point, and this is about 10 years ago, 24 million kids were living without fathers in the home with them. They were split. Maybe the fathers weren't there at all. Maybe they were part-time dads. Whatever the case would be, 24 million kids are living without their dads. I'm going to have Diane throw up on the next slide, uh, slide here. And this is from uh, the National Fatherhood Initiative. Uh, I like how they just start off just the facts. And, uh, think back to the late 60s, we've got a cop showing up. Just the facts. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 19 and a half million children, more than one in four, live without a father in the home. That number has come down some from this original statistic. This is just um, within the last year or two. Just the facts. Children raised in a father absent home are more likely to experience behavioral problems. Right. Let's go to the next one. More facts. Children living without their father in the home are 47% more likely to live in poverty. Children with imprisoned fathers are more likely to have depression. It affects 
every aspect of our children's lives when the parents are not raising those kids together. That's a harsh reality. Now why is this? It's because millions of dads don't know how to be men. Our world has forgotten to teach our boys how to become men. We've talked about it, we've heard it before. What is that defining moment when you became a man? We heard that in the movie. What? When they, got, they were talking about it around the table in the backyard at the barbecue. What was that defining moment? And you remember what the one guy said? He said, when my father told me I was a man. When he told me I was a man. We need to, as a church, as Christians, we need to cry out to God. We need to get on our proverbial knees and we need to cry out to God. We need to stop being complacent and be courageous. We need to rely on God like Gideon. And that's who we're going to talk about today. We're going to go through Gideon's story in Judges 6 and 7 today. He took a mere 300 men into battle with him. He started out with like 22,000 and was God whittled them down to 300 men. So if you've got your Bibles, open up to Judges chapter 6 and 7 and follow along from there. Now, let's just get kind of caught up because um, we're coming out of uh, Joshua and coming into Judges. And Joshua, this is where the, the Israelites have finally come into the promised land. They have started to take, they've taken the, their homes and they have come into the promised land. And, oh wait, they stopped relying on God. And they, they moved from relying on God the Father, the over, this overarching Father, and they go to wanting a national government. I'm not going to get into politics today. But y'all can put your thoughts behind that one. And as we come into this time where Gideon becomes the fifth judge, we're coming out of 40 years of peace under Deborah, who was our four, the fourth judge of the Israelites. In chapter 6, verse 1, it says, The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. How many times do we read that in the Old Testament? So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. God turned them over to the Midianites for seven years, and the Israelites would lose everything they had. They cried out to God during this time because they were so oppressed by the Midianites. And what happened then? God went and he found Gideon. That's where our story is going to begin today. And we will once again see that when the people rely on God, they prosper. But when they are left to their own devices, they struggle. And this is the predicament. So Judges 6, 7 and through 9 says this. When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who pressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. See, today we're using Gideon's story to answer the question, why have men abandoned their homes? Why have men, and when I say homes, I mean why have men abandoned their families? Well, why have we abandoned God and the willingness to do the right thing. So we're going to cover that in, in, in some steps here. The first one is some men have abandoned their homes. And I'm not going to, I didn't want to put men have abandoned homes because it's not all. Some men have abandoned their homes because they have abandoned God. Judges 6.10 says, I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live. 
but you have not listened to me. You see, when we fail to recognize the God in the universe for who he is and what he has done, we are on a road that leads to failure. God proves his power and his worth time and time again. And while hindsight may be 2020, foresight can be forgetful. We can forget, just like the Israelites, what God has done. And we, as men, we forget what our fathers have done and their fathers and their fathers. We forget. And then we look forward to the future and we don't remember to do the things that God has called us to do. And when we fail to remember God's greatness in the past, we fail to recognize his lordship in the present. And that church is sin. When Israel abandoned the worship of God and turned their hearts towards other gods, they abandoned their purpose. Now their purpose was to, as God's children, take God into all the world. They didn't do that. They forgot their purpose. And they ultimately then forfeited their rights according to the covenant that God had made with them at that time. And the Midianite persecution, that's not an accident. It's not a coincidence. Punishment is met by consequences. Some of you grew up, and Dad would take off the belt, he'd fold it over, and he'd snap that thing and make a loud snap. I, that got my attention. I didn't want any more to do with that help. <laughs> but there were consequences for my actions. I'm not going to speak for anybody else's. When I screwed up, there were consequences. When I screw up today, there are consequences. And the Israelites were handed over to humiliation at the hands of the surrounding nations because of sin and unfaithfulness to God. They didn't listen to the crap that that belt. The proverbial crack of that belt, they did not listen to that and turn from their evil ways. They just kept on going. And see, when we abandon God, there can be a wide range of consequences for that. And it is not going to just affect this little part of your world that you maybe screwed up in. It's going to affect everything. Think about when, when, you, when you lie to your spouse. Many years ago, I was a smoker. Many years ago. That's 2003. We're coming up on 18 years. Well, 18 and a half years now. But when I quit the first time, I quit for a little bit. And then I started sneaking around because nobody was going to know. Nobody's going to know. Until my doctor said, are you smoking again? Yeah. Oh, darn it. I signed a piece of paper that said she could talk to my wife. <laughs> there were consequences. It wasn't just a consequence of my health. There wasn't just a consequence of having to admit that to my doctor. There was a consequence that I had lied to Diane. I had broken trust. There is a huge consequence that goes with that. Do you know how long it takes to earn trust back? Don't find out. That's, my, that's, a, that's a side lesson to me. Don't find out. Maintain that trust. That was hard. And that is part of the humiliation that we go through when we're unfaithful. So here's the next one. Some men have abandoned their homes because they are afraid. They're afraid of the responsibility of being a husband, of being a father, of being a provider, of being a spiritual leader. They are afraid. Judges 6, 11 says, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a winepress to hide the grain from the Midianites. He was responding to the Midianites in fear. And when we abandon God, oppression mounts, and we respond in fear. Gideon was threshing wheat by hand rather than by using cattle. He was trying to keep it 
I went down what he wanted to make sure he was providing, but he was hiding it. And that's why he had such a small amount of wheat. Think about when you try to do things, you know, try to be quiet about them. This morning, you know, unloading the dishwasher, that's a quick job, it takes what, just a couple minutes sometimes. I was trying really, because Diane was still sick, got the kitchen, pulled it out real quietly, taking one piece of silverware out of time, laying it in the drawer real quietly, because I did. So it took me forever to get it done. And that's what was happening here with him as he was threshing the wheat. It was taking him forever, so you only have a little bit of time. And rather than doing it on a floor built for the threshing, he was in a wine vat, so he was out of view, so he wouldn't get caught. Now, this wasn't something that he was doing wrong in the sight of his family, but it was so that he wouldn't be caught by the Midianites who were oppressing him. And he was living his life in absolute fear. Have you lived your life in fear? Have you been afraid of anything in your life? I used to be afraid to walk to school for fear of getting beat up. Some people have gone through that. There's all kinds of reasons to be afraid. First time I drove down to St. Louis, I hit a deer on the way back. And then he did, he made it back down to back pretty nice and easy. I came back and I hit a deer. I have been afraid of hitting a deer for years since. Now I'm actually more afraid of hitting a scooter. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, it, it just changes. But We've allowed the world to come in and capture our homes and our families and our purposes because we are afraid. They come in through TV shows, through movies, through magazines, in the newspaper, on the internet. It just is permeating our lives. The world is coming in and taking over. And our children, here's the thing, our children are being kidnapped by sin. They are being brainwashed by popular culture. And we simply shrink in fear because we don't want to rock the boat. Because we're afraid of what will happen. Mark just mentioned it a little bit ago. Social media, and it's not just the government that is calling them to censor people out. These social media platforms are censoring people out. They're private companies. They can do what they want. It's their stance. I am watching godly men and women who are standing up for truth. They aren't spewing hate. They're speaking in love. They're, they're, they're using it as a platform to spread God's word. And they are being silenced. Either they're uh, on something like TikTok, they're, they're, they're taking them, throttling them back so people don't see their posts. And they're doing the same thing on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram. And then, oh, heaven forbid you, you do something against community guidelines and they ban you altogether. These people are starting to stand up and say, not anymore. I won't be silenced. You silence me here, I will take it to the streets. I will take it to my family. I will take it to my friends. I will take it to the church. We need to not live in that fear. But many of us would rather our kids look like the world and fly under the radar than to stand up for Christ and pay for it. But when we stand up for Christ, and in this moment I'm reminded of a story that I read years ago. It's about these people who were confessed Christians and the army came in and they stripped them naked and they put them on a frozen lake and they made them stand there until they collapsed. These people loved God. They refused to denounce him. And so they stood there. When one of them passed out and was dragged over to the side, one of the soldiers was reached just by their simple act of obedience. He shed his clothes and took that person's place. Are we ready to stand up for Christ and pay for it? Are we going to be warriors or are we going to be wimps? Some men have abandoned their homes because they are weak. 
for they think they are weak because of what the world has filled their heads with. Judges 6.15 says, But Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. Our only excuse for half-hearted or casual Christianity is weakness. Whether it is masked behind pride or behind humility and fear, the response is still weakness, and weakness comes from ignoring strength. And Gideon certainly was not strong on his own merit. He proved that out by what he said. But he listens to God's response to his call. In verse 16, he says, But I will be with you. God chooses and calls people who are weak to fulfill his purposes in their weakness, making him strong. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10 says, that's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This past week, I sent out a text to the, to, on the church text asking for prayer for a little boy who had surgery on Friday. His second open heart surgery, half a heart. I had talked to the father two weeks prior. And I talked to him again. And I said, hey, we talked two weeks ago. And he started going into it, and, and all of a sudden his tears started to flow. You could hear him crying on the phone because he was so worried about his son. And I said, we're going to do whatever we can to try and help you, whether that's helping you get new phones or, or getting a discount on a signal bus, whatever we can do to get you that service at home so you don't have to worry about your wife and being able to call 911. And he bawled. And he said, we were praying to God for something. And in that moment, I got bold, and I said, can our church pray for you? And he said, yes. I said, can I, I already had this in his wife, and can I have your son's name? And he gave it to me. And I said, we will be praying for you and your family. And he just started, he could barely talk. And on Thursday, I had a meeting with my boss. I said, hey boss, remember that guy I talked to you about a couple weeks ago? So this is what happened, this is what transpired, this is what I did. She said, that sounds great. I was expecting some different response. I was bold. And I, we have to be bold like that. We have to do it more often and do it to where we are not hiding behind our weakness. Because when we do that, we slap the God of our universe in the face. Because weakness, it shows what we think our limitations are. But it's ultimately about ignoring the power of God that is available to us. Because when God calls, when God calls, he equips. When God calls, he provides. When we answer his call, he sustains us and he takes us to victory. Many men today have abandoned their God-ordained responsibility to fight for their families because they've rejected God's first place status in their lives. Mark talked about it this Saturday. We got a big event coming up with the marriage. I know these two. God is first place in their lives. See, I love my wife. God is first place. And when I make God first place, she takes a higher ranking. She's still second to God, but she is loved more. She is cared for more. And I will go to battle. And that just shrinks down, that goes down to our kids and to their families and to our friends. And it just takes us to a whole new level. We can't forget that Jesus is Lord in the face of worldly pressures. Hear this reminder in the scripture. This is right from last week's call to worship. It was the first scripture last week. It was the last scripture last week. It was the first scripture this week. It's 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. When I think of fear, I think of cowardice and, and, and not of timidity, but a spirit of fearlessness. He gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And with that comes sound judgment. See, when, when God is 
leading us and we are not in fear. He is going to guide us and direct us and he is going to give us the sound judgment we need to make good decisions. He wants to answer our excuses by empowering us. He wants to replace our fearfulness with fearlessness. God wants warriors. His supernatural ability can transform us from weak to strong. There's a song in there, Bruce. <laughs> and here's how. Rather than abandoning us, God chooses to transform and strengthen us. And this next statement is going to sound a little weird until you listen to what we have to say about it. God consumes us. So in Judges 7, 6, 17 through 21, Gideon replied, If you are truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring you my offering. He answered, I will stay here until you return. Gideon hurried home. He cooked a young goat. And with a basket of flour, he baked some bread without yeast. Then carrying the meat in a basket and brought from the pot, he brought them out and presented them to the angel who was under the great tree. And the angel of the Lord, the God, said to him, Place the meat in the oven of the bread on this rock and pour the broth over it. And Gideon did as he was told. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and bread with the tip of his staff in his hand, and fire flamed them from the rock and consumed all he had brought. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. I think back to verse 13 where Gideon is wondering about the signs and wonders his ancestors had experienced. Right? All those miracles that they had seen in the desert and all those things that he had heard about growing up and the fact that God brought them out of Egypt. But then in that same thought he's thinking, but God abandoned us to the Midianites. He's trying to figure this all out. But he would soon find out the wonder was in the consumption. Because we are the consumer in every area of life, we tend to make God a commodity. We go and get it when we want it. We put him in a box. We treat God as a consumable, a consumer item. In Christ's economy, we are not the consumers. We are what is being consumed. So when Gideon followed the instructions, laying the offering on the rock, the angel of the Lord consumed it with fire. Romans 12, 1 and 2 reminds us that we are a living sacrifice. Hebrews 12, 29 reminds us that God is our consuming fire. See, for when men stand up and be courageous fathers, it means we are being consumed by God. Think about that. When we're consumed by God, what happens? Your mindset changes. You want different things out of life. And for Christians to step up and be mighty warriors in the army of God, it takes us laying our lives on the rock and then being completely consumed by God. So what are we supposed to do with this? I'm going to ask three questions, but the answer is going to be found in those. Is your life consumed by progress? Or by being used by God? Is it your life consumed with yourself or by your desire to serve others? Is your life consumed by career or by being centered on family? I can say at some point in my life, I was consumed by progress. I was consumed with myself and I was consumed by my career. At one point, I can remember working over 100 hours a week. I carried three pagers. I was on call 24 7. It was nothing to wake up at 2 in the morning and jump on the computer because of some kind of an escalation that required my attention. I was consumed by that. And you know what it did? It tore me, talked about it earlier, it tore me down. It shredded me. It put me at a point. And within a year of that point, God removed me from that situation and he put me into ministry. Something he had been promising to do since I was 14. And I had run from it because I was consumed by self. So if 
we think of these three things. So rather than abandoning us, God breaks us. So God often uses that which is weaker and less likely to win to accomplish his purpose. So think of these, guys, these people. He used a stuttering man as his mouthpiece. Remember Moses? How about David, a shepherd boy who he made a king? He took a simple virgin girl and made her the mother of his son. He made an enemy of God, the champion of the church, and the guy that wrote most of the New Testament, Paul. God often gets glory when the weak become weaker only to surprise the world with his might and strength. And that takes us right into Judges. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, it says, So Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and his army got up early and went as far as the spring of Herod. And the armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Moron. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid, may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to stay and fight. And God, I'm going to pair for the rest of God would say, you still have too many. We need to pare that down some more. So he sent them down to the, brook, to the water and he said, now tell the men to drink. And this is how he pared them down. If they drank from their hand cupped, or if they just stuck their mouth into the creek and drank. Only 300 drank from their hands. And those are the ones that God said to keep. And so Gideon did. And then the Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. Can you imagine the thought process in your mind? You want me to go up against that with 300 guys. Well, he had heard the story, so he, he went ahead and kept the 300 men with him. And God, he got the, the from, you know, over 30,000 men, he got down to 300. And he did this because he didn't want the Israelites to be able to take credit for the victory. Because if they took credit for the victory, they would have just done like, oh, look what we did. We don't need God. God didn't do it. We did. That's why he whittled them down. He shrank that army, and he increased the victory and the glory for himself, and he redeemed his people. And he does this in our lives as well. For God to turn us from weaklings into warriors, from wimps into warriors on his behalf, he often breaks us first. And that seems counterproductive, doesn't it? But that's what he does. But in the heart of God and in the heart of people, we face things. And let's face it, who doesn't like to see the underdog win? I mean, I'm an Iowa State fan. I love the underdog. Okay, that. At least I'm not a Green Bay Packer fan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but my, I have a tendency, the teams that I like have a tendency to be the underdogs. And I always like to root for the underdog. It's like, you see that one guy that's running in the race and he's at the very end and all of a sudden he's like, come on, come on, you can do it, you can catch it. And then all of a sudden they kick it in and win the race and say, yes! We'd like to see the underdog win, and that's what ultimately happens here. God wants fighters, and he wanted them to do it through faith. It would, and think about this, they had just trashed Ball's altar, so they were riding on an adrenaline high at that point. They could have easily gone in and, and crushed the Midianites, but it would have been under their own power, they wouldn't have been relying on God. For us to be warriors, we have to fully rely on God and God alone. And He's going to break us down to do that so we aren't doing it on our own strength. So what about you, your needs? What, what about you needs to be broken and removed so that you can be used by God? Sometimes my own words get in my way. So rather than abandoning us, 
He uses us. And so, just after midnight, it starts in verse 19, chapter 7, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the Midianite camp, suddenly they blew the ram's horns and broke their clay jars. Then all three groups blew their horns and broke their jars. They held the blazing torches in their left hands and the horns in the right hands, and they all shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon! And each man stood at his position around the camp, and they watched. They watched as the Midianites started to scatter. They, they watched as the Midianites started fighting and killing themselves. They watched the Lord do an amazing thing. Those who were not killed fled. When we are completely broken and consumed, we are useful to God. Gideon's story continues with a successful victory with just the 300 men. And by the power of God, Gideon and his army were victorious. The Lord ordered the events and used Gideon's small army to accomplish his purpose. We need repentance. We need revival. We need Christians to stand up and be courageous warriors if we ever hope to see the number of children living without fathers shrink. We have to have the same mindset that Gideon and the 300 had, that God can take our lives and make us victorious with our families and our children. We have allowed far too long the world to tell us what to think about men and families. And distance, the stories I liked to watch when I was a kid, like Leave it to Beaver, you know, they had twin beds in the master bedroom. There was always feet on the floor. They were always fully clothed. It's not what you see on TV anymore. There was a show that I think is pivotal. It was called Married with Children that dumbed down men in families, turned them into buffoons. And that's just been perpetuated over and over again. How many men have fallen into this trap and made themselves useless when it comes to taking responsibility for their families? And what could happen if those same men were to realize God's truth and assume courageous leadership in their homes? Men are the spiritual leaders of their homes. And I can stand before you right now and say, I still have work to do. I will admit that. But I'm a far cry from where I used to be. I'm letting God mold me. But I, there's more to there's more room to grow. But this is where kids don't know, understand this, maybe, but they parents, their father is a spiritual leader, he works in concert with his wife, who is his partner. See, in Genesis, it doesn't say that God made a slave for Adam, he made an equal for Adam. And they are there to help their children grow into the men and women that God wants them to be. What could happen in our communities and even in our nation if, if even some were to strengthen their resolve towards being a, a good fathers? This is what could happen. Families would glorify God and they would realize that God provides the power and victory. God wants us to accomplish his purpose. That is why as we wait for Christ's return, we are to be the hands and feet the body of Christ, the church. There's a, a quote I'm going to have Diane throw up on the screen here. Our readiness is related to our relationships. What's our relationship look like this way? If this is good, because that, think about that. A pole, a pole, like a, a utility pole, it's stuck in the ground, it's sturdy. And then what happens? It gets a bar put across it so lines can go on it, so it can hold the weight of that. If our relationship with God is sturdy and strong, we can be sturdy and strong in our relationships with our families, our wives, our children, our family, and our friends. How we live out our call as fathers, mothers, faithful followers, ministers, evangelists, teachers, and disciples can be weak or strong. We can be wimps or we can be warriors. How Will you respond to the war for your family? Father God, thank you for this sort of love 
the story of Gideon. I love how he went from 30 plus thousand men to 300 and then you did it. And we see how powerful you are. And if we take that same faith and take it and put it into our families, we can see how powerful you are. We can see how what you can do as we raise up young men and young women, as we raise them to be warriors and not wimps. Father, let this be a message and a, a clarion call for us, Father, to be strong in faith and let you show us how to be courageous. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Pastor Jerry. That was an awesome message. And I think as we look at the events of today and we look at of the events and what was going on in Christ's time, the similarities are, are striking. And I think of when um, the Pharisees and the high priests had approached Jesus and, and his disciples were out in the communities and they, they were giving his word and they, they were gathering supporters as they went they were gathering believers together and you know the pharisees and the high priest said hey you got to tell your your followers to be quiet and not to spread this message and and i love what jesus said he said i tell you the truth that even if i do so the rocks themselves will cry out the rocks themselves will cry out God can use anybody, anything to bring forth his message. And it's a message of hope. And it's a message of love. It's a message of self-discipline, of power through him. And as we come into this time of communion today, we think about that. And we think about the power of love. We think about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. His power of love to bring forth God's message. To be able to enable us to be his hands and feet. And to go forth into the world and fulfill that great commission of bringing his word to the world. To embolden us, to empower us, to equip us to go forth. As Terry was talking about in this message today. And so we need to remember that courageousness. It took courage to go to the cross. It took courage and faith to go to the cross. And on the night that he was given up, they had a meal. And during the meal, Christ took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you to take and eat. And likewise, later in the meal, he took the cup. And he blessed it and filled it and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. That mighty act of faith. That mighty act of love. We can't be silent for the Lord. We have to be the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God.
We have a couple here getting married Saturday, Bruce and Shannon. <laughs> and we're just thrilled for both of you. And and um, I just I'm sad Steve and I will not be here because my granddaughter Vienna and Taylor are getting married Saturday as well in Wyoming State, so we'll be there. But um, we're just gonna pray God take care of all of you. So and we have prayers for Becky. She uh, texted in and she's having um, her chest is feeling heavy this morning. So let's just keep her in our prayers this week as we go through the week. And um, she's faced a lot of trauma in her life this last year, a lot of uh, loss and uh, sadness. And now she's having health issues. So we'll just keep her in our prayers. So Father God, we come to you this morning. We pray for Becky. We pray that you will just comfort her heart this morning. Lift her up. Wrap your Holy Spirit around her, Lord Jesus, in the coming weeks. Help her to uh, put on some music and praise your name through this trial that she's going through. Just give her strength each and every day to face what comes. For you are God and you are our comforter in our position. You will take care of us if we praise you. In Jesus' holy name. And Father God, I thank you for Bruce and Shannon. I pray that they will have a beautiful day for their wedding. I pray you bless them immensely as they trust and follow you through their lives. Please bless them daily, strengthen their hearts and minds to join their families together, that all may be blessed by God. And thank you, God, for such wonderful friends and family of this church. You have blessed all of us with your presence. And Father God, I pray for my granddaughter, Vienna and Taylor, as they join together um, in their marriage Saturday as well. I pray many blessings upon them, and I pray they follow you, Jesus, and do your will in all things. Please bless them in their lives together. I pray for all traveling to and from this event that you will put a hedge of protection around all of us and keep us safe on the highways and byways and mountain roads and keep, um, keep all the animals off <laughs> of the roads and around us. <laughs> uh, keep the drivers awake and alert at all times and um, just bless this journey that we're going on because you are so good to us. And I'd like to finish this with the reading in Ephesians, um, chapter 3, 12, verse 12 and 14 through 20. It's Paul's um, prayer for the Ephesians. And I think it blesses everyone. So I just would like to read it. In him and through faith, in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.
the thing. We, this, is, this is what letting God be in our hearts looks like. It's fun. It's light. It's, it's refreshing. It's joyful. And as I think of every, every morning when we get up, you know, God, our Heavenly Father has called us to be courageous in battle. He's called us to be mighty warriors and not frightened with. He has given us scriptures to guide us. You know, Ephesians 6 says, uh, in chapter, uh, in verse 10, says that final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so you would be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. That's the first thing we need to do in the morning. Put on the armor of God and then go to him in prayer. Talk to him. Be preparing for your day because Jesus tells us in John 8, 32, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We will no longer be wimps. We will be warriors. We will be courageous and not complacent. Again, the question comes, where are you people of courage? We need to daily put on the full armor of God and be warriors that God has called us to be. And, and this, this popped up on my Facebook feed. There's a, there's a page called Fierce Marriage. I love this page. And it said this this week. It says, each marriage has a fixed capacity. Meaning we can only take in so much. Fill yours with love, constant affection, affirmation, grace, honesty, and joy. And if we fill our marriages with the things of God, we remove the space for harmful poisons and habits that may try to creep in. That's what becoming a warrior for our family looks like. So as we prepare to leave this place today, take this priestly blessing that Aaron and his sons used to bless the people when the Lord gave it to Moses. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.